the duration of time it takes from the voice of God to you acting determines the volume of God in your life. Think about that. Welcome to the One Cry Podcast, a nationwide call for spiritual awakening. The goal, accelerating the movement of God through sharing revival truth, stories, and reports. And now, your hosts, Bill Eliff and Kyle Reno. Well, welcome to the One Cry Podcast. I'm Bill Eliff, and this is Kyle Reno, and we're co-hosting this. This We're veterans now. I think this is week two. <laughs> yeah, we got to figure it out. <laughs> but the whole purpose of this podcast is to accelerate uh, revival and spiritual awakening. And two ways. First of all, to tell some revival stories of what's happening, what has happened in the past, and what's happening now around the nation. And then just to teach principles and truths about revival right. that hopefully will help us all in our understanding of what needs to happen for that to come. And and we really need it, Kyle, because oh, the world's just getting darker, isn't it? Yeah, it seems like on every front you're looking. Mm-hmm. I feel like Nehemiah many times that the walls are down and the gates are burned by fire. I mean, you right. can look at every front that we're living, you see this tension and anger and and mm-hmm. and, and honestly, just fury. And we we need the Lord to speak to us and to move. You know, I have told several people lately that the only other time I can remember this kind of uh, anarchy in our nation was the 60s. Hmm. And I lived through the 60s and uh, barely. <laughs> and uh, But the sexual revolution, yeah. Kent State, there were murders on college hmm. campuses. Uh, there was rioting everywhere. Hmm. And that led to the Jesus Revolution mm. in 1970. So it's these kinds of times right. that we need revival, but also that are the forerunners right. always to revival because we get desperate right. and we really need God. So I, there's there's only one place, though, that <laughs> revival begins, yeah. and that's with me. Right. So uh, I know uh, God has really, mm. in your life, uh, has mm. walked you through this a lot, Kyle. Take yeah. a minute and talk to us about, about where revival begins. Yeah. Yeah, I would say by God's grace, you know, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Uh, I didn't grow up in the church. I, I really walked into a little R revival, a move of God uh, at 19 years old. I'm 40 now and, and saw what it looks like when God comes to church, when the Lord is moving in our midst. And, and I, I would just say, if you didn't listen last week, I'd go back and listen to that because Bill really articulates what revival is across history and how that's played out in different places and eras and but what I want to talk about, what is what is revival right here in, in my own personal heart? There's a lot of great definitions of revival, and I would add mine to the very end of that list. But I think I would say personally what I've come to know revival to be, it's a real move of God in the lives of real people that really changes places. It's a real move of God in the lives of real people that really changes places places. It starts with, it's a real move of God, meaning it's not man-made. It's not something that we could foster or make happen, but it's something that is solely God, that it has God's power and initiative on it. I love in the Chronicles of, of Narnia, where it says there's that moment where they say Aslan is on the move. Like they look up and they like, hey, Aslan's moving, so things are soon to be changing. Well, I think a, a revival is when you see God is on the move, <laughs> that he's moving in the lives of people. He's moving in specific places, and it, it's a real move of God in the lives of real people. And I, I think the title of this podcast, this episode, is it starts with you. All throughout redemptive history, when God desires to unleash his power on a people, when God desires to move in certain places, it seems that he starts with a person, maybe even a few people. The truth is, and you're coming to know this as we all are, uh, there are few things in life that we can truly control. That's a beautiful thing to embrace, that I'm not the sovereign, that I'm not in control of everything. But there is one thing that you can cooperate with, how much and how deeply you know God, how passionate your pursuit of him is. Are you positioning your life to be transformed by the power of God? Now, we can't make, I love this about revival as you come to learn about it, we can't make the fire fall. 
but we can stack the wood. That we can't force God in the corner and make him move, but we can make ourselves a great target for the wind of the Spirit. We can get the sails up. So this is what I know, just to stop for a second and say, whoever's listening, pastors, lay leaders out there, we shouldn't pray for our church to experience more than we're personally experiencing. We should, we should want it, obviously, for our church, but it starts right here. One of the greatest things a pastor can do, what I can do personally for my church, is so position my life for a real move of God right here in the inner man. One of the greatest things you can do is in a fresh way in this season, say, here's my life, Lord, pour out your power, pour out your transforming work. Now, across Scripture, there's all these different great, there's great pictures of revival. I want to give you literally one passage of scripture that I think will help position our life. Psalm 119, 147 says, I rise before dawn. <laughs> I love now. I'm a morning guy in like the most annoying way possible. Right? My, my wife will testify to that. I, I wake up chirping. So you might be thinking, all right, already. So you're telling me the key to the per, to personal ri- revival is being an early riser, then I'm I'm in trouble. Well, I'm I'm not saying that per se. I would say that across scripture, it sure seems like those that give dedicated times early in the morning meet with God. I think the bigger principle here is this. Do you and I give God time every day to work? Do we give God time every day to work? And you say to work on what? To work on you, to work on me. Like one of the greatest ways that we can position our life is to get down like literally with a pen on a calendar and say, these are the times that are totally dedicated to God, that I'm going to lean in and let the Lord move in my life. I remember a season where God called me to very clearly to 21 days of prayer and fasting, and uh, it, it was as clear as I had ever heard the voice of God. Like 21 days. I literally thought that I'd heard through his word and promptings of the spirit that God was calling me this. I thought, man, for these 21 days, I'm going to meet with the Lord like I'm meeting with a friend. And so I entered into that fast full of faith. And for the first 19 days, I had never felt more distant from God. I, it was like every prayer didn't get past the ceiling tile. I don't know if you've ever been there before. Like reading the Bible was like dust. And, and I woke up on that 19th day early in the morning frustrated, trying to figure out what is going on. And I went to the church that I was serving at early in the morning, nobody there. And I laid at the altar and I was like, Lord, what's the deal? What's going on? And it was like the Lord had let everything get really, really quiet before he spoke really, really clearly. And I think what the Lord was doing is like, will you give me the time to do the work? And over the next couple of hours, the Lord showed me pride in ways I'd never seen it before in me. And I, I would say the principle of that is, I think by God's grace, I'd given him the time. I'd given them the time to do some work in me. Now, the second part of that passage says, I rise before dawn, but I don't just get up. I don't just give God a specific time and cry for help and cry for help. It's one thing to pray. And I think I've never met a pastor of a church that wouldn't, you know, say that prayer is a good thing or a needed thing in their life or in the life of the church. It's another thing to cry for help. It's another thing to embrace desperation. I, I, listen, there's a lot of the principles that run throughout the scripture that we should learn from, but this is a primary one. God draws near to the desperate. He loves it. He is so attracted to desperation. When people really want him, let me tell you what the Lord is not, and what he doesn't seem to move toward is the self-dependent, that those that can make it on their own. But those that will get desperate will find themselves in the right posture before him. One of the greatest things pastors can do in this weird era in which we're leading the church is be boldly desperate before God, before your people. To boldly be desperate. I, if, we, if God doesn't move, guys, we're in trouble. If the Lord doesn't come, one of the greatest things parents can do before their kids is be desperate for God. We need, we need God to move in our family. We need God to direct, give us wisdom, discernment. Like we live in an era where we want to look like we've got it all together. Well, guess what? We don't have it all together. But we have a God that does. 
We have a God that is in control. So you see in this passage, I rise before dawn, I cry for help, and then I love this. I wait for your words. I wait for your words. I want want to tell you something. I'm 40 now, and I've learned a few things. i got a lot left to learn, but I know this. One word from God will change your life. One. One word. The question is, will we wait for it? Will we wait for it? Will we wait for God to speak? Will we wait for God in His literal word, in the Scriptures? Will we give... Will we linger long enough for God to do something inside of us? Will we wait for a word birthed by the Spirit where God says something to you? I, I remember I come from a broken family dynamic, and I remember one time uh, where the Spirit of God let me know that the Father was proud of me. And that's one thing. I know that reading in the Bible, but I'm talking about I knew deep within. It's true biblically. It's obviously aligns with God's word, but I just knew the Father's love. Well, I had I had to I had to give him time. I had to wait for him to hear from him. I've had so many times where God sent a person to give me a give me a word that I needed. I love what Isaiah fifty says: "The Sovereign Lord has given me a well instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear like one being taught." You know, God will, if you'll position yourself, bring people in your life to give you the word you need when you need it. Let me tell you what I'm believing for you today in this season as you begin to posture your life, position your life by giving him time and crying for help and getting into, getting into his word and positioning yourself to hear from God even through the right kinds of people is that the Lord would give you the word that would set many of you free. That the Lord would give many of us, the word that will set you on fire. That will set you on fire for God. And here's the truth. There's many things, implications of what happens when revival comes, but there's nothing more important than this primary truth, and it starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with individuals making decisions to position their, their lives to see God do. And listen, if revival doesn't come to your church, it can come to you. Revival doesn't come to your city. It can come. You can personally experience it. I think our chances are a lot better, though, as we position our life to see it spread like fire across our nation. So let's lean in. That's so good, Kyle. And I just, uh, God draws near to the desperate. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it, isn't it? If if we're not desperate, we don't think we need God. We don't pray. We don't uh, don't go to his word. Mm -hmm. And what you said about getting into the right posture. I, I, I can't tell you how many times um, I have said to a couple that I'm counseling or a woman maybe whose husband is rebelling against the Lord, and I said, well, you can't change this situation. Only God can. But you can get in the right posture. Mm-hmm. And the right posture is what God says for you to be mm-hmm. in, uh, in the Scripture. Mm-hmm. So that's where we want to be. That's where we need to go. I heard Adrian Rogers one time say, uh, I don't know how much of God you have, but I know you have all you want. Yeah. Wow. What a statement. Mm. Uh, one of the men that we're going to hear from right now, uh, Robbie Gallaty, as he's interviewed by by Byron Paulus, is a man who got desperate. Mm-hmm. And because of that, God is doing an amazing work, not only in his life, mm. but in his church. So watch this interview between Byron Paulus and Robbie Gallaty. Well, thank you, Bill, and thank you, Kyle, and what an incredible moment this is to be able to really knit my heart with y'all's and talk about a report of what God is doing. I love that little phrase, revival report. You know, I'm sitting here in my library, and and uh, Bill and Kyle and, and those of you that are viewing today, I pulled out just the other day one of my books that is my favorite. It's called Revival Fire by Wesley Duell, and as you can tell, I like this book, but the reason I like it is because it just tells stories, stories of what God is doing and has done throughout history, and today we are so blessed with one of those reports of one of those stories, not historically, but contemporarily, today, now, where God is at work. So, uh, yeah, I have privilege today of having a guest, uh, Robbie Gallaty, who is... uh, 
a pastor of Long Hollow Church outside of Nashville. And Robbie, welcome, number one. And uh, if I remember right, you called me just soon after God began to move. And, and here's what you said, if you remember or not, I, I love this. Byron, you've been telling me forever about revival and the difference it can make. I believe you now. And yeah. that's because you don't convince people of revival by explanation, but demonstration, seeing it. So Robbie, thank you. And I wonder if we just begin with all these pastors and leaders in our audience today, just give us a glimpse of what you have seen God do. Let's start there. Byron, thanks for having me. Uh, as you said, I was uh, pretty hard-headed uh, at, at the beginning of this, and you were telling me for years about how God was moving and praying for revival and why that was a good thing, and it really touch, uh, took a touch from God for me to really see this. And frankly, before God moved in December, I didn't know much about revival. I didn't know much about praying for revival. Honestly, I'd taken some classes in seminary, but not much. And it took the Lord really working on me and on and through me uh, before he can work a, a revival in our church. And so uh, I just want to take you back to what happened. We're back in March of 2020. Uh, we are going into a season that I was unprepared for. Uh, we had a lot of unrest in our country. We had COVID. Uh, we had challenges in the church. We were going off campus, on campus. And I was frankly burnt out. Uh, I was tired of going through the motions. I was tired of keeping people happy. I was tired of keeping people from leaving. Anybody with me? And I said, there has to be more to the Christian life than this. There has to be more to pastoring than this. I didn't want to run a machine anymore, if you're with me. And so I began to press into God through silence and solitude. And I didn't know much about that, but I wanted to learn. And so I began sitting with the Lord on the porch and just full disclosure, I was praying for God to fix the church, right? Fix the problems in the country. God fixed the problems in my deacon body, fix the problems in my staff. And about two months in of just sitting with the Lord and developing an ear for the accent of the Holy Spirit, God began to speak to me, Robbie, the problem is not with the country. It's not with your church. It's not even with your deacon body or staff. The problem is you. Now, if you've ever gotten that gut level honest with the Lord before, it's pretty painful. I mean, pretty painful. And, and the Lord began to pull back all these layers of pride and arrogance and jealousy in my own life, began to do a deep work on me before he could work through me in the church. And so December 15th, 10 months of sitting with the Lord, uh, I heard as clear as day, it, was, it, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was an internal voice in my head. I heard spontaneous baptism. Now, if you're like me, when I heard that, I was pretty critical of that. I'd never done it before. I'd never really heard of it being done, heard of abuses of it. And I thought, wow, spontaneous baptism, really, Lord? And so I was obedient on December 20th. December 20th, 2020 is when the outpouring of God's spirit happened. God began to give me this, this leading of 100 people. I never... I thought that was pretty overwhelming. 100 people going to be baptized on one Sunday. We were leading the country in COVID cases. Uh, we had told the church to stay home the week before. It was the lowest attended Sunday in the history of my five-year tenure. Noth nobody was there. And yet this is the day we're going to see 100 people, really, Lord? And Byron, that day I was obedient to the Lord. I walked over to the baptistry. I said, I know you didn't come, come prepared to be baptized, but we are. And if your baptism is on the wrong side of your salvation, or maybe you're surrendering your life to Christ, the first step is baptism. Would you meet me at the baptistry? 99 people followed through that day with baptism. And I was blown away, like, like you would be, like, what just happened? So because I had this rhythm, by the way, of sitting with the Lord in silence and solitude, the Holy Spirit was on the And when I got there, the Lord showed me this visual, because I thought it was over. Wow, I'll tell my grandkids about that. What a day. The Lord showed me this picture. Robbie, these are the heavy raindrops before the torrential downpour that's coming. And I had no idea what was about to happen. So now we're 18, 19 weeks in, and we baptized, by God's grace, this is only the Lord, 1,200, and I just found the updated number, six people in 18, 19 weeks, 1,206 people. And I'm just telling you, that is something only God can do. A sermon series can't create that. Expository preaching as good as it is, a song series. I mean, this is something genuinely that God is doing. So, Robbie, I, I've got to stop here and just uh, ask you, 
how has your understanding, Bill and Kyle just talked about what is revival, or they're getting ready to even expand on it some more, perhaps, but how is maybe your definition of revival, your perception of revival? There's so many misconceptions out there, even today, on what revival really is. And then, um, yeah, let's so, so kind of update from your heart what you see through the experience of what God did that maybe you were blind to or didn't accept previously. Well, let me tell you where I believe a lot of people who are watching and listening are. You hear a story like this, and you're already bent to be critical and judgmental. And you know how I know that? Because I would have been a year before if I would have heard my story now. But what I want to share with you is something I've learned. And, and I asked the Lord, why would this happen at Long Hollow? What are you teaching me? And the Lord re really impressed upon me. I used to read stories of revival. You'd read the fires of revival. You'd hear about Moody and Finney and think, man, that's great, but that could never happen here. That can never happen today. And like Byron said early, earlier on, what you're hearing today is a relevant real world outpouring of the palpable presence of God. And I'm here to tell you, I, I don't want you to hear my story that, wow, that, that can't happen. Listen, I'm a former drug addict, alcoholic, Roman Catholic who had no desire for the Lord, robbed his own family for $15,000, went to rehab twice, $200 a day, heroin and cocaine addiction. I am the last guy with the resume that God's going to pour out his revival on. And yet, once again, God shows us he does this for the foolishness of the world to show that it's not based on intellect or ability. It's based on being open and available to the Lord. So I just want you to hear this. What the Lord showed me about revival is this. The hindrance to a move of God in our church, the, the, the blood clot may be you, brother. Listen, sister, it may be you. Like the limit that was put on the ministry of Jesus, and I'm studying so much of this now in the Gospels, was the unbelief of the people. When the people began to believe in a big God to do great things and really surrender to that, that's when God began to move. And I hate to say, I mean, I'm not saying we, we change the sovereign hand of God, but in a sense, we limit God so many times with our carelessness to pray and our lack of belief. And so I would rather get to heaven and God says, man, Robbie, you believed me for way too much, brother, than to say, man, you prayed shallow, offensive prayers. God showed me this, Byron, just a side note. My prayers have been way too small. That God should, don't, don't insult me, Robbie, with things that you can do in your own power. And so I'll ask you this question today, if you're, if you're with us. What are you praying for right now? What are you trusting in God for? That if God doesn't act, it won't happen. That's the kind of big prayers I want us to pray again. That's terrific, Robbie. And you know, you said something early on and uh, I want to pick up on what you just said about God working in you before uh, he works through you and uh, another uh, episode of this. But uh, you said something early on that really captured me. And after 45 years of being in a revival ministry, if somebody asked me, asked me, what is one major key ingredient, common denominator? Prayer obviously is, humility as you expressed is, but I, I think it's that word obedience doing exactly what God is asking you to do and really doing it instantly and with faith. So you got on your porch, got alone with God obediently to what he called you to do. And then baptisms, <laughs> spontaneous in my church. And you said, okay, I'll obey. And so I would say, and unite with your heart, Robbie, to our audience, our pastors and leaders. And, you know, we've been in 7,000 churches as a, as a local church event side of our organization. And I think every one of our revivalists would say the degree to which we obey, beginning at the top, is the yeah. degree which God will pour out his spirit. Yeah. And I'll just say one thing on that, if you don't uh, let, let me say this, because I really believe this is key. And I didn't see how a simple step of obedience could make a big impact. But my staff, who's walked with me from the beginning, said, Pastor, do you realize this was the week before Christmas Eve? Half our staff were gone. We were leading the country in COVID cases. This would have meant a lot more work for us if you would have just said to the Holy Spirit, you know what, obedience to baptism spontaneously, we'll do that after we get back. Just that simple pushback. I'm not on this podcast. We're not talking. 
and we don't see the greatest move of God ever. Here, 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 here's what I want to share with you as we close. The Lord showed me this. The, the duration of time it takes from the voice of God to you acting determines the volume of God in your life. Think about that. The duration of time between God speaking and you acting determines the level of the volume of the voice of God in your life. And I don't know about you, when God speaks, whatever he says, I want to act because I want him to speak. Wow. And you know, my favorite definition of obedience just is aligned with that. It's doing exactly what God says instantly mm. with a right heart attitude of faith. Mm. Thank you, Robbie. I'm going to take it back to Bill and Kyle. Wow. Uh, we can hear definitions of revival, Bill and Kyle, but I'm telling you, we just experienced uh, a story that defines revival. Wow, what an incredible <laughs> uh, story. That's it. And, and, and we, uh, Kyle, I know your desire and mine is that this would just be repeated yeah. over and over and over again. That's what happens in extraordinary moments of God's presence. Yeah. He met him. The Lord met him and changed that mm. pastor. And now mm. it's changing the church and a community and Lord do it all over. And, and you know what you said earlier in the podcast, that God gives you a word. Mm -hmm. And if you get a word, <laughs> uh, you, you can do anything right. and, and you have direction. Just, just see here with Robbie's testimony, God spoke to yeah. him yeah. when he got quiet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I want to say to all of us here yeah. once again, uh, you're not going to find God unless you seek for him. That's right. He's waiting. In fact, he's knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. But you got to open the door. Mm -hmm. And part of that is giving him time. I mm -hmm. mean, can you imagine uh, with the God of the universe <laughs> coming into your quite, quote, devotional time and saying, now, Lord, I've got 20 minutes and then I got to go do this. And so yeah. I'm going to read a little bit of scripture. And I'm going to go through a little prayer list, and then, I, but that's all the time I've got right. for the whole day. Wow! When you see it like that, it's just preposterous. Mm. And uh, so we want to challenge all of us yeah. to do what Robbie has shared and what and illustrated and what Kyle has taught today. Uh, posture yourself mm. for a move from God. Yeah. And one of the day, ways we do that, uh, Kyle, is by prayer. Yeah. And we want to take time every podcast yeah. to just pray for revival. And, yeah. and so uh, I wonder, Kyle, if you could mm -hmm. begin in our prayer time. And yeah. we want to invite you to pray with us, yeah, not just please. listen, but enter in with us in prayer. But let's pray for this very thing yeah. that we've talked about today. Yeah. Begin us. Lord, please. I mean, right here, right now, mm -hmm. I'm asking for just the, a fresh move of the Spirit in my life, Lord, to help yeah. me. That, Lord, I, I tell you. I wait for you, Lord. I'm, I'm longing for your words, God. I'm longing for your help. I'm crying. We are crying for help, Lord. I pray for every listener mm -hmm. on this podcast, Lord. Right. Uh, we, we cry out on their behalf. Help them. Yes. Speak to them, Lord. Say things mm -hmm. that set people free and set people on fire for the mm -hmm. gospel, Lord. Mm -hmm. So please come. Please come and move in our day. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I join in that prayer uh, for me. Yeah, uh, Lord, I pray there just wouldn't be a day that I don't give you time, mm -hmm. all the time you need. And Lord, wake us up in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. We we think of David who said, "I love the night watches," mm -hmm. because that's where he met with you, and mm -hmm. that's where you spoke. And uh, so, any way you want to, Lord, but I pray that it would be the passion of our heart to be with you. Mm -hmm. And because when we're with you, everything changes. And I pray for all who are listening today uh, that regardless of their schedule, Lord, it's, it's kind of a foolish thing when we think about it to say, well, I don't have time for God, for the one who made me, uh, for the one who orders my steps, for the one who is going to receive me into his kingdom if yeah. I believe in him, and to say, I don't have time for him. Hmm. So, Lord, forgive us for that. Just forgive us for that whole spirit that will not give you time. And I pray, Father, uh, for everyone who's listening today and across our nation, we pray that you would slow us down, yes. Lord, and put us in the right posture so we can hear from you and you can move and set us on fire mm. 
So that's the prayer of our hearts, Lord, mm. and uh, make it the continual prayer of our heart mm. in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, what a what a great mm-hmm. day, and we're so glad you've joined us, mm. and we hope you'll join us next week. Yeah. Uh, if you're watching by YouTube, uh, we would encourage you to like and comment or subscribe. Also, uh, you may rather listen on just an audio podcast, mm-hmm. and so you can subscribe on iTunes or any platform that you use. And we would encourage you also to go to a onecry.com mm-hmm. website. There is just all kinds of material and help for you for personal revival. In fact, we'd encourage you to start a seven-day personal revival journey that we'll help you with on the website. Uh, And our featured uh, resource for this week is Prayer with No Intermission, a little book that will help you in 40 days just go right into the heart of God. So thanks for joining us and position yourself this Mm. week for a move of God. 